This morning we're going to talk about the investigative judgment through the healing lens. How many have heard of the doctrine called the investigative judgment? Okay. How many have a clear understanding of what that is? Yeah. Have you found that doctrine to be kind of sometimes, I mean, maybe you studied it, but it's like, as you read it, it's like, I must be missing something. There must be some piece I'm, I'm not quite getting because it seems pretty difficult to comprehend at times. Well, hopefully that we'll present this to you in a way that maybe you've never considered it before. And I tend to an evidence-based approach. I'm going to try to put the pieces of, of evidence together to see if we can't bring, a, bring it to, to home for you. So first, the investigative judgment is a unique doctrine to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As far as I know, no other Christian organization has this particular doctrine. This doctrine came out of the Millerite movement, the Millerite movement in, uh, 1840, in the 18, early 1800s, uh, predicted that Christ was going to come in 1844, then he didn't come in the aftermath of the Great Disappointment of 1844. People wanted to understand, well, what happened? How do we understand this Bible prophecy? We were so sure something was going to happen. And in the aftermath of that disappointment, they eventually developed a doctrine called the Investigative Judgment. Daniel 8.14 is the prophecy that William Miller used to predict the date of 1844. And so the, the high points of what the traditional model of the investigative judgment taught within Adventism has been is that the 2300 day prophecy ended in 1844. Christ entered the most holy place of the sanctuary in heaven in 1844. He began cleansing the sanctuary of the sins of the people. This uh, also required the investigation of uh, of records and, and judgment and investigative judgment to determine who was fit and who was unfit, whose sins had been accounted for and whose sins had not been accounted for. All cases uh, of the uh, professed followers of Christ get reviewed and uh, findings are made. God's judgment in who he uh, allows into heaven and who he doesn't is vindicated and he's proven that, that he is right in his discernment and, dis and judgment. And it, uh, the investigative judgment ends with human, uh, ends human probation, and it culminates in the second coming of Christ. This, these points are the points you'll find if you look in the 27 fundamental beliefs and the 28 fundamental beliefs on the investigative judgment. These are the high points of what this doctrine kind of brings together. The entire presentation and historical view of this is predicated as a legal or taught as a legal process. It's the investigation of records legal accounting of sins, judicial findings, rendering of legal judgments, removing of record of sins from books in heaven. This entire thing is predicated on this view, single idea, that God's law functions like human law. A system of rules that you impose that require external adjudication, a judicial finding of some magistrate to investigate and come to a conclusion. Most thinking people recognize there's some flaw in that. He who knows all things, and from the beginning, he doesn't need to investigate. He knows everything. There's no need for that. There's, there's many, many questions that arise in this doctrine for people when it's presented in this, in this view that God functions like human courts function. But I'm going to suggest to you, I'm going to show you the evidence that in fact this idea that God's law functions like human law is the lie that's infected the sanctuary or contaminated that the sanctuary doctrine is to be cleansed or the sanctuary is to be cleansed from. How do you see God's law? Do you see God and his law as designer, builder of space, time, reality, his laws, the laws upon which life are constructed, including the physical laws, but also the moral laws? And just like physical laws, laws of gravity, laws of thermodynamics, you can't change them. You cannot change moral laws. And just like when you violate physical laws, there's damage to you. When you violate moral laws, it sears the conscience, hardens the heart, warps the character, takes you further and further out of harmony with the, the kingdom of love and God's design for, for life. Or do you see God's laws no, no different than a Roman Caesar making up a rule and then threatening to punish and kill you if you don't keep his rule? designer I just described, and the dictator, the rules imposed with threats of punishment. Well, let's look at the Bible. What does the Bible describe as God's law? In the Old Testament, if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and soul, then all these various blessings follow. New Testament even expounds this more. Romans, love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is fulfillment of the law. Galatians, the entire law 
is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. James, if you keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbors yourself, you're doing right. But maybe we should turn to Jesus, who said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and neighbors yourself. All law hangs on this. All of it. Now, this is not simple compassion. This is not simple empathy or concern. This is functional. It's operational. It's constructional. It's how God built reality to function. And when God built his reality, it's an expression of his nature of love. And Paul says in Romans, that God's divine nature is seen in what he has made so that men are without excuse. There are many examples of this. The one that's most easy for people to grasp is the, the law of respiration. Every breath you give, you give away carbon dioxide to the plants and they give oxygen back to you, which is a never-ending circle of giving upon which life is built. But you're free to transgress the law. You can tie a plastic bag over your head and selfishly hoard your carbon dioxide to yourself. But the wages of that is... This is a physical example of exactly what happens when you violate God's moral law. You're cutting yourself off from the source of life and you will die. I'm going to tell you a secret. Now, when was the last time you got up in the morning and said, man, I've got to breathe today. <sighs> 12 breaths a minute, let's see, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours. That's a lot of breathing. You see, when you're healthy, you don't even think about it. Breathing is easy, but when you're really, really sick, Breathing can become painful. It can become hard. You might even need artificial respiration to help you breathe. When God has his way in our life and fixes what's wrong inside us, it will be as easy to love other people as it is to breathe. That's the natural, God-designed function for all of his beings. But we're really sick. We don't naturally love. We're fear-based and self-centered and afraid of getting hurt. We're self-protective, and so we need God's artificial love respirator to help us love well now. But his goal is to fix us and set us free to love like he loves. Christianity, the early Christian church, the apostolic church, functioned on this. Jesus gave of himself, sacrificed himself in love to heal and to save. Greater love is no man that he give his life for a friend. This is how we know what love is, that Christ gave his life for us, and we to give our lives for our brothers. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who surrenders or gives his life for me will find it. There's this principle upon which life is built that God is trying to communicate to us. The early church operated this way. You see them living communally, sacrificing to help those less fortunate, giving of themselves for others, refusing to go to war against the Roman state, instead dying self-sacrificially as martyrs, and the gospel spread in the first century rapidly. Something changed in Christianity, though. What changed in Christianity? How they understood God's law, and therefore how they understood God. Daniel actually prophesied this was going to happen. He prophesied a little horn power is going to rise, and this power is going to seek to change God's law. And so the question, how did the idea, and notice I put the word idea, because can human beings actually change God's law? No, we can't do it. We can only change the way we think or the idea or concept of God's law. How did the idea of God's law get changed? Imperialism, that God's government or laws function no different than the way human beings' laws function. Now, what is the evidence that I can show you from history to prove my point on this? Well, what church committee ever got together and decided to change the laws of gravity and vote in committee to change the law of respiration? I understand in California there's a lot of fires going on right now. There's some bad air quality. Why doesn't the committee get together and say, if you join the Adventist church when the, when the pollution level gets to a certain level, we won't require that you breathe. You'll be free of that burden. You, you laugh at me, but there's a point here. Church committees never vote to make those changes, do they? And there's a reason. Why is the reason? Because they can't. It won't make any difference whatever. So what would it mean then if a church committee did vote to change God's law? Wouldn't it be proof and evidence that they don't see God's law as design law? They see it just as an arbitrary set of rules that's changeable. And in fact, you know the history, the church did change the commandments, God's law, the worship from one day to another, removed the second commandment about images, split the tenth into two. They made changes to the law. Why would they do that? Because they don't see God's law as design law. And so the real change to God's law is not the change in the day of worship. The real change to God's law is how you conceive of his law, a system of rules like men make that God has to adjudicate and inflict punishments for breaking. That's the real change that infected Christianity, that the little horn was going to come across 
This is Eusebius, the first church historian. And notice what he writes. With the Roman Empire, monarchy had come on earth as the image of the monarchy in heaven. You understand what that says? The, the imperial system that crucified Christ is now Christianity. This is the Christian, first Christian historian, not world historian, Christian church historian is telling us that God runs his government like Caesar runs Rome. This is Lindsay's uh, book on the history of the Reformation. It says, the great men who built the Western church were almost all trained Roman lawyers. Tertullian, Cyprian, Augustine, Gregory the Great, whose writings formed the bridge between the Latin fathers and schoolmen, were all men whose early training had been that of a Roman lawyer. A training which molded and shaped all their thinking, whether theological or ecclesiastical. They instinctively regarded all questions as a great Roman lawyer would. They had the lawyer's cravings for exact definitions. They had the lawyer's idea that the primary duty laid upon them was to enforce obedience to authority, whether that authority expressed itself in external institutions or in the precise definitions of the correct ways of thinking about spiritual truths. You know, the thought police, these are the doctrines, these are the creeds, these are the 28 fundamentals, you better adhere to them. No branch of Western Christendom has been able to free itself from the spell cast upon it by these Roman lawyers of the early centuries of the Christian church. Imperialism, God's laws, like our law, and when you break our law, justice requires a ruling authority must punish. And there must be a county, there must be a record, and some record book of all the sins. And those sins have to have some payment made for them. And there's some, it has to be some time in history when the judge will go in and look at the records and see who's been paid and who's not been paid. The entire investigative judgment has been corrupted by imperial law, which is not God's law. Daniel prophesied. I watched, the horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. We were losing the war until until the ancient of days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints. Well, what kind of war is this? What kind of war? Notice what it says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we use, they're not worldly. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. What do we demolish? We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against. Now, here's the core issue in the war, the knowledge of God, and take captive every thought to Jesus Christ. Now, if you're in a battle, in a war over knowledge, arguments, pretensions, and thoughts, where's the battlefield? The battlefield's your mind. In the war, Satan is the father of lies. And he's going to get you to believe lies, and we're going to go into that this afternoon, how lies actually affect your neural circuitry and your brain structure. As he gets you to believe lies, he exerts power of you. That's why Jesus said the truth will set you free. Exactly. We're in a war that centers over the knowledge of God. Paul describes this same little horn power. Now notice, little horn power is going to wage war, and we're waging war over the knowledge of God. Now here's the same little horn power. He calls it the man of sin, the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. This little horn power that Daniel prophesied, Paul picks up this red and says, here is his power, he's going to wage this war, and he's going to set himself up in God's temple. Question to you, what temple? Paul's writing after Christ's life, after Christ's death, after Christ's resurrection, after Christ's ascension into heaven. Christ is now reigning in heaven, and he says this man of sin is going to arise, and he's going to set himself up in God's temple. Is he telling you that, that this man of sin is going to ride a, a chariot up into heaven and knock Jesus off his throne and start reigning up there? Is that what he's saying? Yes, no? No, he's not saying that. So what temple is he talking about? The spirit temple the temple of our minds and hearts. How? How would this little horn power that's going to wage war, this man of sin, how is he going to oppose everything that's God and set himself up in our temples? By changing how we view God's law such that we come to worship a being who functions like an imperial dictator. God is presented as a dictator, a cosmic executioner, the source of death, and pain and suffering, all, of course, under a judicial magistrate, so it's all just and proper, you see. 
the world goes into an age of darkness. And darkness covers the people. Gross darkness, the people. If the spirit temple is the temple defiled, where the man of sin has arisen and, 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 and now reigns, what temple needs cleansing? Well, God prophesied that a time would come in history that the temple would be cleansed. Daniel 8, 14. 2,300 days, years, and the sanctuary temple will be cleansed. Well, interestingly enough, this is a unique Adventist doctrine, and so one of the founders of the Adventist church in the book Great Controversy expounded, because you understand Daniel 8, 14 only tells you a time frame. It doesn't actually tell you what is being cleansed, just that the sanctuary be cleansed at this time frame. But this author expounds that and says, the coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8, 14, the coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days is presented in Daniel 7.13 and the coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi 3.1-3 3, 3, are descriptions of the same event. Okay, so what's Malachi 3.1-3 3, 3 say? The, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come. He says, says the Lord Almighty, but who can endure the day of his coming? For he stands, who will stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. What do, what do refiner's fire and launderer's soap do? Cleanse, purify, okay? He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and, may, and refine them like gold and silver. Well, who are the Levites? Notice, eight. Investigative judgment, cleansing of the sanctuary. Sanctuary is being contaminated by a war with a little horn power, setting himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. But yet, at this time, in 1844 and on, the, 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 the Son of Man will come to his temple to cleanse something. What is he coming to cleanse? The Levites. Who are the Levites? You also, like living stones, are built together into a house to be a holy priesthood. Hmm. A holy priesthood. The Levites are the priesthood of believers. And it is this that Christ is coming to cleanse when he comes to cleanse his temple. According to scripture. So if you're, if you're talking to Adventists and they say, okay, do you believe in a heavenly sanctuary? When I often think, you don't really believe in a heavenly sanctuary. I stop and say, tell me, according to inspired writings, what is the material from which the sanctuary in heaven is constructed? What is it built from? As soon as you ask that question, it changes everything. The Bible is very clear. You can find many texts in Scripture and the writings of Ellen White both. And you will find that always it's like this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together to rise to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you are being built together to become a dwelling place in which God dwells by his spirit. I'm not going to give you more because we had a short program today, but there are many, many more texts that say the same thing. If you ever say, well, what's the heavenly sanctuary built out of? And let me ask you, is that sanctuary that was just described built by human hands or built without human hands? This is a sanctuary that human hands does not build. Well, how does he cleanse the Levites? This is that same passage we quoted a few minutes ago. I quoted it from the NIV a moment ago. Same passage now from the King James. I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints, and he prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints. The NIV said until judgment was pronounced in favor of the saints. The actual Hebrew means to impart. Until judgment was imparted or given to the saints, Think what that means. If you're thinking through a human law model, until a judicial finding. If you're thinking through design law model, we, our minds have been attacked by a liar. We've been infected with distorted concepts. We have been confused in our thinking about God. We need to have better understandings. We need discernment. We need to have better judgment. Until judgment is given to the saints. Until your ability to judge more clearly has been in doubt. And how does that happen? Satan is the father of lies. He's lied about God and misrepresents God's law. And many people view, worship a God who's just like Satan in character. Christianity accepted the lie 
and God becomes the source from which we need to protect it. I will tell you, just look at the doctrines you believe. How many doctrines that you believe in Christianity have the function of doing this for you? This is what they're doing for you. They're hiding you or protecting you from God. Covered by the righteousness of Christ, so the robe of righteousness. When the Father looks at me, he can't see my wickedness. Washed in the blood, so when the Father sees me, he won't see my wickedness. Have the blood applied to my record book, so it erases the record of my sins. So when the investigation comes, he won't see any record of my sins. Have Jesus stand between me and the Father and plead his blood to the Father on my behalf, so he won't... Notice the function. Why do we have so many doctrines hiding us and, fun and, and protecting us from the Father? Because we view him as the source of pain and suffering, and he'll kill us if he sees defect in us. That's imperialism. That's the lie. The truth, God is our creator. We are out of harmony with his design. He has been working. God is for us. Who can be against us? He did not spare some, but gave him up. How long, not along with him, give us all things. He has been working through his agencies to heal and restore. And when we get that reality, we pray like David. Father, search me and see the wicked way in me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The temple, your mind, your heart is what needs cleansing. How does, the, how does he cleanse the Levites? Notice what Paul wrote in Romans 3, 4. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. You have to be given judgment so that you can make a right judgment about who? According to Paul, God. Why? Why would God need to be judged? Well, imagine you're in a loving marriage relationship. You love your spouse, but somebody's come to your spouse and told your spouse you're cheating. You're not cheating. You're loyal. You love your spouse. But your spouse believes it, and your spouse moves out. Your spouse has filed for divorce. You love your spouse. You know your spouse is a victim of a liar. You want reconciliation. You want your spouse back. What will you have to do to get your spouse back in that circumstance? Won't you have to prove your innocence? Who's on trial? Yes, God, ultimately, in our metaphor, it's the innocent spouse is the one on trial. God is the innocent one, but he puts himself out there because he knows he's innocent. He knows if you investigate, if you'll investigate, you'll discover the truth that he's been lied about and he's completely trustworthy and you'll be reconciled to him. So in Revelation 14, the third angel's message, this church is supposed to take to the world, but they don't. And we haven't because we're stuck in imperialism. And what's the message? Fear God. Be, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment. His judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth. But level one through four, those stuck in imperialism, it's be afraid of God because the time in history has come for him to investigate your records and he's going to go through every list. And if you have one sin you have forgotten to ask Jesus to apply his blood to, then he's going to hold that against you still and he's still going to punish you. You better have a good memory. Level 5 through 7, be in awe of God and glorify him by revealing his character of love because the time has come in human history for people to make a right judgment about God, to worship him who made the heavens, the sea, and the earth, and all of them, to come back to the designer, the creator, the builder of reality. And God prophesied that a power would arise and infect the spirit temple. The little horn power, the man of sin, set himself up in God's temple by lying about how God's law works and that's how we see God. It would be 2,300 years before enough truth would be recovered that we could actually see God clearly and reject these lies and come back to the true knowledge of God and thus restore trust. And when restore trust happens and we open the heart and the spirit comes in and takes what Christ has achieved and reproduces it in us that we get new hearts, new motives, new spirit. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And so let me give you this historic Seventh-day Adventist view. And I'd be interested if anybody has already seen this afterwards, come up and tell me, I knew that one. But I have very, very few Seventh-day Adventists, lifelong Adventists, who ever seen this. You've got to wonder, why is this kept from the people? This was written by Ellen White, one of the founders who helped to um, build this doctrine of the investigative judgment. Now notice what she writes. The first tabernacle built according to the God's, was, first tabernacle built according to God's directions was indeed blessed of him. The people were preparing themselves to worship in the temple not made with hands, a temple in the heavens. The stones of the temple built by Solomon were all prepared at the quarry and then brought to the temple site. They came together without sound of axe or hammer. The timbers were also fitted in the forest. The furniture was likewise brought to the house, all prepared for use. Even so, the mighty cleaver of truth has taken out a people 
from the quarry of the world and is fitting this people who profess to be the children of God for a place in his heavenly temple. We want the cleaver of truth to do its work. We are taken from the glory of the world. The material must not be a dead substance but living souls. And, this, and these souls must be brought out of the glory of the world where the hand of God can fit them for the temple in heaven. We are here as probationers. We must pass under the hand of God. All rough edges and rough surfaces must be removed and we must be stones fitted for the building. We are brought into church capacity with defects of character. We must not retain them. We must be fitted and squared for the building. We must be laborers together with God, for we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. In view of this, we must see that our temple is not defiled with sin. We should be lively stones, not dead ones, but live ones that will reflect the image of Christ. Where do we find ourselves now? Did you understand what that said? The heavenly sanctuary is built out of living souls, and you are a, a living stone built together into the house for the Lord. And the only way to cleanse the heavenly sanctuary is to cleanse you. I'll give you a quick, quick metaphor on, on how the records, if you want to go the record routes, it's cleansed. Imagine that you have a child who's dying of some terminal disease, and the doctors tell you there's no hope, no hope, whatever. But you hear a doctor out east that every person who goes to them leaves with a clean bill of health. And so you call, is it possible will you see my child? And yes, they said, bring the records with you. And so you come and you have this thick medical record, MRIs, uh, biopsies, scans, all the pathology there reported. And he opens the records and he pulls out all the record of disease, sticks in blank white sheets of paper, hands it back and says, no more record of disease, you're going home. Are you happy with that? That's classic Adventist investigative judgment. Their records are being opened and he's taking out the record and sticking in blank sheets. However, you, here's the real deal. You go to the record, the doctor looks, there's a terrible pathology, but the doctor gets up, doesn't change the record, goes over to the child, intervenes in the child with a remedy that puts the cancer into remission. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The cancer cells remit back to their previous healthy non cancer state. When we partake of Jesus, our characters and hearts remit back to God's original ideal in humankind we become like Christ again. And the records show the pathology of the disease, the records show the application of Jesus Christ, and the records show we have new hearts and right spirits. We're like Christ again. That's how the records get cleansed. This other thing cheats people. It che causes, causes them to live in fear because they know they haven't had a heart change, and they pray that God will never figure it out and see it, and they pray that it will be covered and it will all be hidden. Where do we find ourselves in a war between two versions of God and his law? A God who's like Satan, alleges, inflictor of punishments, arbitrary rules, dictator type, who must be the source of holding you accountable, versus a God who, like Jesus revealed, who is love and who's created all his universe to operate in harmony, is love and is working to restore and heal you back to harmony with him. People are settling into one of the two views. Those who love God and others more than self, such that they would give their lives at others might live. These are they who do not love their life so much as to shrink from death, Revelation 12, 11. These are the sealed of God. But there's another group, another group who believe, uh, either believing the beastly methods of coercion and thus, because they believe that's right, they mark themselves in their forehead, or they practice the beastly, beastly methods of coercion and thus mark themselves in their hands. God is waiting for a people to be so settled in the truth about him that, he will, that the end time will come and he can come back and receive them. The war began in heaven over God's character and his law, his law of love. It will end over the same issue. You must make a judgment. You must decide. Is God the kind of being Jesus revealed, our designer, our creator who seeks to heal and to save from our terminal sin condition? Or is God like the being Satan alleges, imposer of law, who is the source of inflicted pain and suffering. And if you don't appease or pray the proper legal penalty, he will ultimately kill you in the end. Whom will you serve? The choice is yours. And do we have time for questions? Or are, we, are we done? 15 more minutes. We have question time now. Can you uh, get another mic, Simon? And, uh, Raise your hand and Michael come around if you have a question. If I can see into the shadows here. 
Anybody have a question? Here's the time. Okay, go ahead right there. And then Dan, that be next. Go ahead. This mic down here, please. Number 13. Yep. So I just wanted to clarify if I understand what um, I'm hearing you say. So the 1844, um, the beginning of the investigative judgment, then is the time when we are to be cleansing our minds of the lies and thinking what's correct about God. Can you say more about that? I mean, it's so different from what we've been taught. You know? Yes, so my position, putting all the pieces together about this war, is that after Christ achieved what he did, that Satan counterattacked by taking what he did and misrepresenting it through imposed law. This was a payment that had to be made to an angry God who would punish you if you don't. And thus the law of God got changed. The Lord power seek to change God's law. Humankind came to view God operating no different than we operate. And thus we have lived in fear and we've constructed theologies all designed to protect us from God. This is part of the infection. God looking through the corridors of time and this is how I see most Bible prophecy working, he is telling us this is when this is going to happen. It's going to be 2,300 years from this particular time until the sanctuaries are cleansed, until enough truth has been restored and recovered, the Reformation gets to a certain point that we can finally see God clearly again and reject these lies. And that was the raising up of this church for the purpose of worshiping him who made the creator, the designer, and coming back to, to worship the builder of reality instead of the dictator who looks like a Roman Caesar. That's what I understand it to be. Over here. Yes. Um, I have a question. And are you talking about the, that spirit comes to our temple because the Bible says that we are temples of the Holy Spirit and, and that uh, we should take care of our bodies as well as our mind and uh, spirit also. But are you talking about sanctification that we've been uh, taught, uh, you know, that we are supposed to um, uh, go through the process of sanctification until Jesus comes. Yes, yeah, so that word has a lot of meaning for a lot of people. Sanctification, maturing, growing up, healing, uh, overcoming difficulties or character traits and so forth. Sure, certainly, if you like that word and you're comfortable with that word, I'm okay with that word. Um, what it means is the healing, restoring, growing, maturing process that we become more and more like Christ every day. This is the healing of heart that happens and transforms us as we are being fitted for that temple. Remember it says in 1 John that when Christ comes, we shall see him face to face, for we shall be like him. We will have been brought back to have characters like Christ at the time he comes. And so that's what the cleansing of the sanctuary is. He's preparing a people that are living stones. And so when you talk about the Bible sanctuary metaphor that we are living temples, we are individually living temples for the Spirit, but the Bible also says we're collectively a temple. You all together are living stones built together into a temple. And this living temple is the heaven temple where each one of us, a unique being as a temple, is a stone in the larger temple. Yes, right here. Um... I've been taught through the SDA church that Jesus is pleading for us before the Father. And I'm wondering if you can explain that a little bit. And I have one more question if you have time for it. And that is that we're covered by his blood. So in other words, Jesus uh, is covering us with his okay. blood so the Father doesn't see this. Okay, so, so let me take the first one first, which okay. was the pleading before the Father. Yes, there's quotes. Jesus before the Father pleading for us, okay? How do you understand that? Do you see it through imperialism? Which law lens do you look for? Uh, and, and if it's through imperialism, then he has to plead his merits to the Father rather than he's pleading before the Father. Put together what Jesus said. It's expedient for you that I go. If I, if I go, if I don't go, the comforter will come. When the comforter comes, he's not going to speak on his own. He's going to speak what he hears. Isn't that what Jesus said? Who do you think the Holy Spirit's listening to? Whose voice is the Holy Spirit on earth? You get, 
Jesus Christ. He's, God is still omnipresent. God the Father can be anywhere he wants. Jesus Christ has restricted himself. The Holy Spirit is, is Christ's representative on earth. And so when he's before the Father, he's carrying out the Father's purposes. And what are the Father's purposes? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. If God is for you, who can be against you? Jesus in John 6, 26 said, I will not pray the Father for you. The Father loves you himself. So the, Jesus, before the Father, is carrying out the Father's goal of saving you and me. And who is it that needs convincing that God loves you enough to save you? Who is it that needs convincing you're not sinful enough? Uh, I mean, that you're not so sinful that God won't save you? Who is it that has the whispers in their ear that you've gone too far, that you're no good, that you're too corrupt? Who is it that needs the pleading and begging to let you be saved? God doesn't need to be pled with. He loved you and already sent his son for you. You're the one who needs to be. So, yes, he's before the Father, pleading through his spirit who's listening and who's communicating those pleas to you. Don't you know I love you? Don't you know I die for you? Don't you know I'll, I'll, I'll heal you? Won't you let me? And I stand at the door and knock, please. That's what the pleading means. Now the blood, Jesus said, unless you drink my flesh, excuse me, drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part with me. Was he talking cannibalism? No, this is metaphor. This is symbolism. The life is in the blood. And so bread and br the flesh and blood got translated into two other symbols, still symbols, bread and wine. Now, bread or flesh, and when you eat it, it becomes actually broken down into molecules and become building blocks into your tissues of your body. And as the flesh or bread is to your body, so the word who was made flesh came and dwelt among us, and Christ is the truth. I am the way, the truth. And as you partake of the truth or the word that Jesus gave, those ideas, those truths, those concepts dispel lies. They become building blocks of new beliefs, ideas, constructs, which help form your trust basis in God. You open the heart, and he pours his love into your heart, his character in your heart. The life is in the blood, and thus we, we partake of the blood, which is the life of Christ. And it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And so the covering... Or the robe, if you're reading Christ Object Lessons, page 315, 311, 311, 315, I think it's 311. Um, the robe woven in the loom of heaven has not one thread of human devising. It says, when we open our hearts to Christ, our hearts are brought into harmony with his hearts. Our desires are changed to be in union with his desires. We think his, we live his life. This is what it means to be covered in the robe of righteousness. The covering is not a covering over. The covering is when the Father looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ because the righteousness of Christ is actually reproduced in us and we live the righteousness of Christ. That's what it means. Yes? Um, would you happen to have a... Um, well, let me start again. Uh, when I first heard this kind of a message, it took me a little while to you know, kind of absorb it because it's, it's quite a bit contra to um, a lot of the things that we've been taught in the Adventist community. Uh, much like learning physics for the first time. I didn't really get it for a couple of months, and after a while, okay, now I understand what's happening. Do you have uh, perhaps a way for some of us to go about going from zero to 60, you know, like a quick start guide for, uh, you know? So our change. website, comeandreason.com, filled with resources, lectures, videos, sounds classes, but we also have lots of blogs, and if you go up in the search engine on our website and type in investigative judgment in the search engine, you will find a blog where I lay out on the blog, you can print it out, all the resources, all the reference, taking you step by step through this entire process. Yes, who, I don't know where the mic is at this point, so whoever's got a question. Okay, I, I um, want to follow up a little bit on, on this this. Uh, revelation that we have uh, that you're describing about the truth of God's character. Steve, hold it up close. Okay. Uh, what level of right thinking actually translates in the salvation that you're uh, within this concept? So the level of right thinking that results, okay, so the cascade of destruction, we went through it last night, I'll do it again very quickly, lies believed break the circle of love and trust. You're in a marriage relationship, you believe somebody's Somebody's told you a lie that your spouse is cheating, but they haven't. But you believe the lie, something inside you changes. Lies believed break the circle of love and trust. Broken love and trust result in fear and selfishness. Fear and selfishness result in acts of self-protection. I'm going to get the money. I'm going to not let you live with me. And this is a terminal condition. The healing progression starts with the opposite. Truth believed destroys lies and wins the trust. Restore trust in God. We open the heart. This is Romans 5. He pours his love into our hearts. Trust and love expels fear 
and selfishness. And rather than acts of self-centeredness, now we engage in acts of service, acts of giving, acts of love, acts of righteousness. And those acts witness the kingdom and help us grow and mature in godliness. This is the healing cascade. And so the level that's required is enough truth, comprehended, experienced, understood, whichever word you want to, want to use there, that wins you to trust God and open your heart so his spirit will transform you. That's what's required. You have to be one to trust so you surrender your heart to God. That's it. You don't have to know the, the 27 fundamentals. You don't have to know the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. You don't have to know which, which horns of the, of the beast stand for what and so forth. You have to know God. This is life eternal. You might know you, the only true God, and be one to trust. That's it. And all these other things, the more of this I know, the more I trust him, and the more I admire him, and the more I'm confident in him. So the more I know about his kingdom and reality and design laws and protocols, it only affirms my trust in him. Yes, True sets, sets free. Yes, go ahead. With this understanding, what would be the significance of Jesus moving from one compartment to the other? So, okay, so this then goes to the whole understanding of the sanctuary. One of the problems that Adventism has had if you read, is that they actually don't apply a lot of what Ellen White says. Ellen White says the key to unlocking the mysteries of the sanctuary of the Old Testament is the gospel. Understanding the gospel in Jesus Christ, that's the key to unlocking the mysteries of the Old Testament sanctuary. However, what many Adventist theologians do is they take the sanctuary doctrine and they go to the Old Testament and they make Jesus conform to their understanding of the Old Testament. And so they have what the Old Testament priests would do from one compartment to the other. And then they say, well, Jesus is moving from a building in heaven, just a bigger building from one compartment to the other. Rather than recognizing that the entire Old Testament sanctuary, guys, get your mind around this. If you haven't heard this, it's theater. There's a stage, really cool stage, nice props, neat costumes, and a script that some people call scripture. It's a script. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a drama. It was an acted out theater that recurred in yearly cycles to act out God's plan theatrically to heal and to save. But none of it had any salvation value. That's why it says in Hebrews, the blood of bulls and goats can never cleanse the conscience. And so when you, you have to then decode the elements of the sanctuary, and if you decode the elements of the sanctuary, which I can't do today, I have a whole hour or something presentation on that, but I'll, I'll give you a little clue. In the Old Testament system, where did you find the law of God? Where was it found? If you wanted to go and touch the law of God, where would you go in the Old Testament system? Most holy place in the ark, right? Where in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, is the, is the law found? In your heart and mind. Is that giving you a clue? Okay. In the Old Testament, you sprinkled blood in, in these various places. In the New Testament, you internalize. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, it goes in you. Okay? Uh, and when you start decoding, but I'll, I'll give you this one, and we'll, we'll probably have to close on this one. If you look at the Ark of the Covenant, what does it represent? The lid to the Ark, according to New Testament, Hilasterion, the lid represents Jesus Christ. It was solid gold, and it represents Jesus. He's the lid. The angel, angels on top represent the angelic host. The Shekinah represents God the Father. So you have God, angelic host, uh, Jesus Christ, but then you have a box which is made out of this porous wood that's all covered in gold that's below, the, the, below Jesus, underneath him. And that box represents the converted hearts of sinners. Now, three things went in the box. Remember what three things were in the box? Manna, rod that budded, and the law. And, and you know they went in a certain order. The first thing that went in the ark was the manna. Exodus, Exodus 16. Law didn't come to Exodus 20. Exodus 16, they got manna, one in the ark. Jesus said, I'm the bread of heaven. You must first partake of Jesus Christ. The truth, the word, which I said already, wins you to trust. When you partake of Jesus and are one to trust, you open the heart, then the covenant, I will write my law on your heart and mind. And then once the law, which is the law of life we talked about, is written in your heart, you who were dead in trespass and sin are brought back to life and you give the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Aaron's rod that was dead and lives again. That's what it symbolizes. And that's what's happening in this process. Healing and bringing us back to life. And thus then the ark represents what? All things in heaven and earth united together at Christ at the cross. And we have the fathers touching the ark, the lid. The angels are touching the lid. And the sinful reconciled beings are touching the Christ is the connecting link with the whole universe is reconciled. Thank you very much.